Today on Monkey Life, a first for the park, with the birth of a baby for rare Gwenon couple, Nia and Benny, and Alison is delighted. It's a bit of a voyage of discovery, not only for them, but for us too. And a world of adventure awaits woolly monkey Cosmo. Cosmo! If he can just muster up enough courage to venture out. Good boy! Plus, breakfast for the orangutans, but it's all a bit puzzling. Monkey World in Dorset, buried deep in the English countryside, is the largest sanctuary of its kind on the planet. The team, led by Dr. Alison Cronin, rescue and rehabilitate abused and unwanted primates from all over the world. Hey, Mrs. Benny and Nia. Oh, there's the little boy. The park provides a home for more than 260 monkeys and apes from 24 different species. It's been just over 10 months since the park welcomed a pair of rare, young, red-bellied Gwenons. They're the only two being kept legally in captivity anywhere in the world. Originally smuggled from the wild forests of Benin in West Africa, they were eventually confiscated while in transit at Beirut Airport. A charitable organization called Animals Lebanon, set up to improve the welfare of animals in the region, took them in and cared for them. Six months later, Benny and Nia arrived at Monkey World. They moved into a specially renovated house and enclosure, along with two unlikely housemates, Patas Monkey Nietzsche and aging ring-tailed lemur George. When we first agreed to take on the red-bellied Gwenins, it was a little bit different than the other species we have at the park, because there are no others anywhere else in the world, which means we have to make a serious decision about what the plan is for their future. And for me, I thought it might be an idea if we allowed them to have one baby just to make them a family unit. So we didn't worry about birth control. Benny and Nia had a few health care issues. They also needed to settle down. But it's happened. The first baby has arrived, and it's a bit of a voyage of discovery, not only for them, but for us too. The team knew Nia was pregnant, but with so little known about the species, they weren't entirely sure when the baby would arrive. Then, one afternoon, Nia gave birth. No one from the team witnessed the event, but mum and baby are doing well. The new family are being kept indoors for now, so the staff can keep a close eye on how they're coping. But so far, Nia is doing all the right things, and her new arrival is suckling and keeping a tight hold on mum. You know, people might say, hey, you're a rescue center, you shouldn't be breeding them. To be quite honest, I don't really care what other people think or say to me. Letting this baby come was just about giving something to Benny and Nia personally to let them feel a solid family unit and to have the most full life here at Monkey World that they can have. We're just pleased that it's clearly a very healthy little baby and Nia's done really well. And it looks like that she and Benny are gonna stay a tight family unit and look after the baby really well. The primate care team at the park keep a record of the weight of all the animals in their charge. They try to weigh them at regular intervals because monitoring weight gain or loss is a good indicator of the primate's general health and it's weigh-in day for one of the youngsters at the Loris Complex. It's Slow Loris Nora, another new resident at the park who arrived from the Lebanon. She came to Monkey World five months ago after being confiscated from the pet trade by the authorities there and then cared for by the team at Animals Lebanon. She was only a few months old and weighed just 190 grams and was in very poor condition. Now, she's a very different Loris, and growing rapidly. With plenty of exercise, her muscles and strength have developed well, 
When she last hit the scales, Nora was 370 grams, and Karen's keen to see if that's increased. Loris are nocturnal primates, so everything is carried out under red light conditions. She was weighed a couple of weeks ago, so we're going to try and keep regularly weighing her, obviously so we can keep an eye on her weight, but also so that she's always used to the scales. It's just a good behaviour to get into them when they're younger, as we have a lot of issues weighing the other ones. So while she's being good and getting on the scales well, we want to make sure we keep reinforcing that behaviour so it becomes uh, normal and she's always happy to do it. Nora, can you come see? Karen sets up the scales. Nora, where are you? What's the best route for you to get down to me? Providing Nora with an easy route to reach them. Hi there. Loris's are notoriously slow moving, but Karen knows exactly how to persuade Nora to be a bit more mobile, enticing her with tasty insects. You get it? Clever girl. Loris's love them. Mmm. Delicious. Today, it's waxworms, but speed is, well, relative. The clue is in the name. Slow Loris. There she goes. Despite her enthusiasm, Nora's just a bit too slow, and the scales time out. Good girl. You're doing a very good job there, but the scales have switched themselves off. You want to come this way? Karen needs to persuade Nora off the scales so she can reset them. All I need to do now is get her away from the door, put some more worms on the scales, and then I'm sure she'll go back on perfectly. Simple as that, really. And it is. Nora's fondness for treats, and for Karen, makes the job easier. Hi. She's just very human-focused because she's been raised for the past five months by people, so it's understandable. You get that one, that one. You got it? Go. And look, more on the scales. Second time lucky. Good girl. Get them feet off as well. One toe left. Can you move that little toe? There we go. Wowzers. <laughs> well, she's certainly eating well. <laughs> she now weighs 480 grams. She's <laughs> 110 gram gain. I think as a baby, any weight gain is good because she's growing. In the first like few weeks or months when you have a new animal, it's always nerve wracking. You don't know whether the change and the, the new people and the new environment is gonna knock them a bit and knock their confidence and knock and not want not make them not want to eat. And and so it's always good, even though we can see she's doing it well and we, we know she's eating, it's always good to get that second. They get the actual weight on there, so you can actually put a number to it, so it's good. It's great news. Since her rescue as a tiny, malnourished infant, Nora's grown into a strong, happy and healthy Loris. Mental and physical stimulation is vital for all primates, so the team work hard at finding new and innovative ways to keep them engaged and active. At Tuan's orangutan group, the team have come up with a novel feeding design based on an Indonesian food container. We call it ketupat, and this is the idea of just trying to get uh, everybody climb up high. Although it's same height as my height, but uh, I'm still taller than them, and uh, they st I still have to climb up uh, to get the stuff inside. And this is the idea of uh, enrichment and sharing equal portion of their breakfast. The device is designed to give everyone an equal chance to feed. It takes patience and tenacity to reach the treats, slowing down the more dominant individuals, particularly Tuan. They always move really, really fast. But when you put it inside of this, Tuan have to work really, really hard to get this stuff out because when you see, like all the stuff inside there, it's really, really difficult. So he got to use his arm and his leg to stretch it open to get apple or whatever you put inside there. And the small people, low, low ranking people, for example, like uh, Awan, uh, she can get stuff as well because we put a lot of them inside. And it's Leader Tuan who's first out. He's now at least 35 years of age, 
and it's important the staff keep him active. Given the opportunity, he tends to take the easy option. To prove the point, he immediately heads for the nearest and lowest feeder. But, as predicted, he struggles to get his large hands inside the holes. However, he shows remarkable agility and balance as he tries to force the feeder apart. Six-year-old Awan, the youngster of the group, has already managed to prize out an apple, proving that, as Jarno hoped, being smaller in this task is somewhat advantageous. Lucky approaches the task with panache. By supporting her entire body weight with one arm, she uses her remaining limbs to force open the feeder and grab the apple inside. Tuan has moved on to number two. His huge hand's more of a hindrance than a help. By looping the feeder over the hose, Lucky again shows impressive initiative. Now she can easily reach without overstretching. Lucky is quite a dominant female, and at times intimidates the other ladies in the group. The team are always trying to come up with activities that might grab Lucky's attention, taking her mind off any power-grabbing politics. What better than a baby? Hu Zhan, a 21-month-old male orangutan, hand-reared at Krefeld Zoo in Germany, will soon be heading to the park to join them. The youngster should be a real boost for the entire group, providing an infant for the older females to mother and a playmate for little Awan. For now, Awan has more than her fair share of breakfast. She has two puzzles on the go, and she's not sharing with anybody. She picks out the monkey nuts inside, while nosy Sylvester looks on from one of the high platforms in the orangutan nursery. Tuan's look has changed. He's hit the jackpot without effort, finding a pile of monkey nuts which have fallen from one of the feeders and been missed by the others. And when breakfast is over, Awan gets a loving hug from Lucky. Let's hope she'll share her aunties with her new arrival. It's a big day for one of the younger members of Lavar's Woolly Monkey group. 18-month-old Cosmo has had a busy year. He was hand-reared by staff at the park after Mum Isla rejected him, and he's come on leaps and bounds. Cosmo settled in well with his new woolly family and loves his house and outside caged enclosure. But now, it's time for this young man to take another big step in his development. We're letting Cosmo out into the forest for the first time. We thought it was about time that he started to really test his climbing skills and start climbing these really big trees in the outside area. Hopefully it won't be a massive anticlimax and he won't just sit on the platform and he will come out and actually explore the trees and start using that tail and be really impressive and start going up into the trees like he should do. Cosmo is still quite small and, unlike other youngsters, doesn't have a mum to carry him and show him the ropes. So the primate care team have adapted the enclosure to help Cosmo take his first steps into the tree-filled forest. Zingu, with her daughter Layla on board, is first out. She gives the new rope ladders a glance, but not ready to test them out yet, she heads off in search of food. Lavar is next, and with his usual flair and bravado, he immediately tests the new apparatus. With five-year-old Bueno Jr. playing follow my leader not far behind. Olivia bags herself a tasty carrot, while agile Zingu reaches down to pick a juicy blackberry, showing daughter Layla how it's done. The skill is avoiding the prickles. The group are enjoying the great outdoors, but there's one missing. Young Cosmo is still inside and wondering where his family have gone. Lavar heads back in to show him the way. Cosmo! 
Eventually, with a bit of encouragement from Lovar and the primate care staff, Cosmo takes a peek outside. Cosmo! He looks around tentatively, building himself up to take a first step into this unfamiliar new world. But he's not prepared to take the leap just yet. While the youngster bides his time, Zingu finds such a tasty caterpillar that she's salivating. And Layla shows she's a quick learner reaching out for a blackberry. Good boy! Finally, Cosmo takes the plunge. He's still uncertain, but he tentatively makes his way into the enclosure. And once he's out, he can't resist the temptation to take a better look at the wonderful new surroundings. Watching some of the younger members of the group relish the delights of the enclosure spurs Cosmo on. Soon, he can't resist exploring this exciting new world, albeit with a little caution. He even has the confidence and poise to hang upside down foraging for blackberries, discovering for himself that they're covered in prickles. Not having a mum to copy means his woolly skills will take longer to develop. But all in all, it's been a good initiation to the great outdoors for Cosmo, and the team couldn't be happier. I'm personally really excited. It's the final chapter in graduating Cosmo into this group full time. He is doing really well. Um, the next couple of weeks, he'll really just be finding his feet. Um, but it's really exciting, and it's a, a really good a success story for Cosmo and for us here on the Woolly Monkey team. After such a fantastic day, Cosmo decides some rest and familiarity are in order and heads back indoors. The park has five mixed sex groups of capuchins, ranging in size from 20 in the largest group to the smallest, which houses just five primates. The primate care team constantly monitor them all, watching to see if any are struggling or unhappy. Sometimes this means moving an individual to another group in order to give them the best life possible. And that's what's just happened with Gizmo. We've moved him up to the top capuchin house. He's now living with four females um, and he's doing really well. He was struggling in Sonny's group where he was. It's a very large group. There was 21 individuals in there um, and he just really struggled with that large amount of animals. So we moved him up to a, to a smaller facility with less animals. Gizmo has come a long way since arriving at the park back in 2004. Jim and Alison rescued him from a home in Ipswich, where he was living in a filthy, unheated shed in the back garden. Oh, jeez. He suffered 19 yeah. years on his own yeah. in these appalling conditions, with a complete lack of care. So it's no wonder he's had issues over the years. He struggled in the larger groups. He found it difficult to socialise with the other individuals, and it meant that they gave him a bit of a, a tough time. They targeted him and they'd give him a bit of a chase around, which isn't ideal. Um, we would sleep him on his own at night because it was just nicer for him um, to give him a bit of peace and quiet. Um, but that's not really ideal. Capuchins are social. They should interact with each other and live in these groups. Um, so we wanted to try and do something that would facilitate Gizmo being able to do that. The sad passing of Tao provided the opportunity to move Gizmo into a smaller group, consisting of just four ladies. Maggie, Ginger, Maddie and Sophia. Thankfully, the four girls took to Gizmo straight away. They all absolutely adore him. They follow him around like a little shadow and just try and get any attention they can off of him. We've actually seen an enormous change in Gizmo since he's come up to this house. Um, he is so happy compared to how he was before in Sonny's group. He's really playful. Um, we didn't have the opportunity to see that much before, um, but now his true character has really come out and all the primate care staff absolutely love working with him. The move means wary Gizmo has fewer individuals to worry about, although there are four feisty females to contend with. But there's no competition from other males and fewer egos. It's great to see Gizmo finally settled and relaxed. Autumn is coming to an end and the days are growing shorter. Over at the Siamang enclosure, 
Abdi from the primate care team is putting out a seasonal treat, so the gibbon pair can make the most of the last rays of autumn sun. He's distributing pumpkins filled with yummy nuts and mealworms, full of protein and ideal for the chillier weather. Sam and Sasak quickly head out, keen to discover what's on offer for this morning's breakfast. The pair have been inseparable since they met eight years ago, following the tragic death of Sam's son and, prior to that, his partner Sage. Gibbons mate for life, and the park went to great lengths to find Sam a new companion. When Sasak arrived from Dublin Zoo, their bond was instant. The doting couple spend most of their time together, grooming and foraging in their wonderful tree-filled enclosure. At this time of year, there's less food to find, so today's pumpkins, complete with wriggly mealworms, are a real treat. Sam is feasting on as many insects and nuts as he can. Keen not to waste any, the pair hunt around for mealworms which may have fallen into the undergrowth. Sam has no problem reaching, grabbing and rolling a pumpkin towards him. As he tucks in, Sasak is equally enthusiastic. She munches happily on a large chunk of pumpkin. Siamangs are the largest of all the gibbon species, living in high mountainous regions where fruit isn't always readily available. They rely more heavily on leaves, favouring young leaves and buds. At this time of year, there aren't many of those, so grass is a tasty addition. When the two have feasted, it's back to grooming, a bonding ritual this pair enjoy. Before stretching out in the warm autumn sunshine. Next time on Monkey Life, James travels to Germany to meet a baby orangutan in need of a new home. Very cheeky looking orangutan, very playful. Looks like he's going to be full of bags of energy. And the spider monkeys have a really good time searching for breakfast.